I had one person who had not taken it yet. You'll have them on Wednesday. Okay, so we're starting the last kind of unit of the, of the uh, class, poetry, which begins on page um, 755 in your book. <clears throat> And hopefully you read this, but um, Myers' comment at the bottom of that page, I think, is, is pretty helpful. Whatever the poem is, he's writing this about the one on the, next, on the following page. Try reading the poem aloud. That is, before you do anything else, just read it aloud. Okay? Um, and, and do it once or twice before you start kind of paying attention to it. So we're going to do that, but we're not going to do it with snapping beans. We're going to go on page 757 with Robert Hayden, those winter Sundays. And we're going to kind of take it apart and then we'll get into the other stuff. So this is not a poem that's assigned on the syllabus, but it's one I'm kind of adding as a result of a, taking a few minutes to talk about it today. I know nothing about this guy other than that I'm pretty sure he was from the Northeast, New England. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then with cracked hands and ached from labor in the weekday weather, made bank fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know, what did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? So let's go back to the first stanza. Your title tells you it's something about Sundays in winter. It's those winter Sundays. So when you start reading a poem, you pay attention to individual words at first, then phrases, then clauses, then sentences. Or you can do it the other way around. Sentences, clauses, phrases, individual words. So let's look at, let's say, the first long sentence. It goes from Sundays 2 to Fire's Blaze. Sundays 2, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then with cracked hands and ache from labor in the weekday weather, made bank fires blaze. Sundays, what's the next word? Two. What does the two imply? Every other day of the week. This father, my father, got up early. And what does he do every morning of the week? He gets up early, puts his clothes on in the blue, black, cold. So getting up early and putting his clothes on, you don't really need to analyze that. You don't really need to interpret that because that's crystal clear. Blue, black, cold? How can the cold be blue, black? Well, when does he get up? Into the first line. Early. Blue, black is telling us the color of the night or the sky. Okay? It's not 3 a.m. when it's black, black outside, when it's pitch black outside. It's blue, black. So the sun is approaching the horizon, and you're starting to get that little change of color in the sky. So he's getting up before sunrise and does what? With cracked hands and ache from labor in the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. So what's he do for a living? I don't mean specifically. Where does he work? Where does he spend the majority of the day? In the weekday weather? He's outside? His hands ache from what? Labor in the weekday weather. So he works with his hands, and he does it outside. What kind of jobs could that be? Farmer? Construction? Possibly mechanic? Okay. 
And what does he do with those cracked hands that ache? They're cracked from exposure to the elements. What does he do with those cracked hands that ache? They're in pain. He made banked fires blaze. What's a banked fire? Has anybody ever spent a night at a beach or spent a night at a bonfire? You have a bonfire, you sleep, you get up in the morning, and what do you have where the bonfire had been? Ash and coals. So he makes banked fires blaze. The banked fires, he's talking about a wood stove. Before they go to bed at night, throw several logs in, close the damper so it doesn't all burn quickly. Okay, So there's a slight draft to create enough, um, to allow enough oxygen for the fire. So that he comes in in the morning, he shakes the grate in the fire in the wood stove. I've lived in several homes with wood stoves. Shakes the grate, ash falls out, exposes the coals, and he banks that up. Why? This is the only source of heat in the house. Right? So he's warming up the house. No one ever thanked him. Who's the no one? Family? The speaker? Do we know how many other people are in the house? Nope. We know there's the speaker and there's the father, at least. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. How do you hear cold splintering and breaking? Now you could take an Alaskan cruise, you could take a Norwegian cruise, not the Norwegian cruise line, but actually go to Norway, and see glaciers calve, that is, icebergs break off from glaciers, and you could hear that cracking and breaking. It's the same idea. If you've ever lived in an older home, and you've been in that home during the cold, and you either, if you have AC or central heat and air, you turn up the heat, what do you start to hear gradually? Why? Louder. It's like settling. The house is settling and or expanding. Put this bottle in a freezer, and what's it going to do, obviously? It'll freeze. It'll turn to ice. What's going to happen to the shape of the bottle? It's going to get distorted. Why? Because the ice, the water expands when it freezes. Put it back out in the sun, and it's going to shrink. Okay? Homes do the exact same thing. You heat them up, and they expand. Cool them down, they contract. Those are the sounds the speaker is hearing. When the rooms were warm, he called. Notice, not just one room, multiple rooms. Why would he call then? Why did he say, get up out of bed, you lazy... He'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, facing the chronic angers of that house. So why does he wait to call until the rooms are warm? What's the father doing? Making sure he stays warm. Making sure who stays warm? Is the father doing that for himself? No, he's doing it for the other occupants of the house, whoever those are. Slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Is the house itself Angry? That's personification. It's ascribing anger to the house, but for what purpose? It's, it's not, the house isn't haunted. The house isn't evil. There's one in this house. Is this a family full of love? No. There's anger. Fearing the chronic angers of that house, comma, Speaking indifferently to him. What's doing the speaking? Is it the chronic angers of the house? Or is it the I? And what does it mean to speak indifferently? What's it mean to be indifferent? Not caring. Not 
carry. We have a one word phrase we use today that describes it perfectly. Whatever. If somebody says something to you and you reply, whatever, that means I don't give a rat's you know what. Go to, I don't care. Speaking indifferently to him, comma. And then we get two lines that fill in the him. Who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. Notice, the father drives out the cold. How? By banking up the fires. And what else does he do? And notice, he does that with what? Sore, cracked hands. And what else does he do? While the house is still cold but warming up, he polishes the speaker's good shoes. Why? What day is it? Sunday. It's Sunday. These are the speaker's Sunday church shoes. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lowly offices? Why is the question repeated? Why do we repeat something today? Emphasis. You want to really get it across, you know? But what kind of emphasis? What, what's the tense? Speaker doesn't say, what do I know? Speaker says, what did, telling us it's when. Title, those winter Sundays. The those with red in light of the body of the poem implies when are those winter Sundays. And the speaker's what? Past? Childhood? Youth? <clears throat> What did I know, what did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Austere means what? If a government starts an austerity program, that implies what's going to happen in society. What's going to happen to, you know, social programs, welfare, food stamps. It's all going to get cut. Why? Because the government doesn't have the money to afford it. So austere means bare. It means cut back, okay? Thin. Loves austere and lonely offices. What's meant by offices? It's not like, you know, go down this hallway and there's an office down there. What else is meant by office? Duties, responsibilities. Do we know who the speaker is? No. Nope. Is the speaker male or female? We don't know. That is, we're not told. Can we make an inference? Can we make an educated guess? Notice, the inference or, or educated guess would not be conclusive. It would not be, I am emphatically sure. But it can be an educated guess. What did I know? What did I know? Implies something. That implies that the speaker now knows. I didn't know then, but I do know it now. Why? The speaker is saying this when. Now, looking back on a childhood, so the speaker is an adult, and the speaker is suggesting, I now know of love's lonely and austere offices. Because of that, the speaker is identifying with the father. Now, I could be wrong, but I think that kind of implies the speaker is a son who has grown up to become a father. And he's going, in my damn ungrateful, 
little breads are just like me. Now I know of love's lonely state of offices. Why? Because he implies, the speaker implies, I should say, the speaker implies, I do maybe not the same, but similar things, and what do I get in return? Whatever. Indifference. Not caring. Okay? So, what did we have to do to tease, let's say, some meaning out of that poem? Is the meaning that we've discussed, is that all stuff we put into it? Or is it implied by the author's choice of words, by the author's diction, okay, by the author's syntax, arrangement of words, by the author's tone? What is the tone of this? Is this, yay, we love each other, it's a wonderful family, let's go off to Disney World. No, it's not. It's what? Kind of depressing, right? Kind of melancholy, kind of solemn. Kind of like, man, Dad got the raw deal there. Okay? Turn the page. Top of the next paragraph. What's most important about your initial readings of a poem is that you ask questions. If you just read it like you watch TV, it's not going to mean anything. And, and by the way, that applies not just to poems. And that applies not just to literature. It applies to everything. You read something on the internet. You read a billboard. You watch a television show. You hear a newscast. You listen to a podcast. Whatever. You ask questions. Because if you don't, you might as well be a cow. Literally. Because cows don't ask questions. It's people that don't ask questions who, as a poem, we will read. Yeah, I think we are. As a poem, we will read, I think, suggests, get what you deserve in life. So, push the envelope. If you read responsibly, that means what? You treat that poem like it is a person sitting across the table from you, and you're having a conversation. He speaks, I speak. We don't speak at the same time. Okay? So, he speaks, you ask questions. You speak, he asks or she asks questions. You'll find yourself asking all kinds of questions about, like, words. What do words mean? Because what words mean indicates how we understand them. Descriptions, sounds, structure, etc. Look at the next poem, John Updike, Dog's Death. That's a poem that we have later in the syllabus. So we'll talk about it now, and then we won't do it the day that it's assigned. Dog's Death. What's the title tell you? A dog died. Or a dog dies. Okay. I forgot to, to say this before I started this poem with my first class. If any of you have recently, like in the last couple of weeks, had a well, well loved family pet die, you can leave. I'm serious. First time I taught this poem, that morning, put my dogs out or open my, my um, laundry room door into the garage to let the dogs out there to feed them, not knowing the garage door was open. And both dogs run out, and one of them. The offspring of the older one, about an 80 pound lab, runs out of the street and gets swept by a car. Flies 10 feet, put them in the, take them to the vets, and then I have to go teach a damn poem. Pretty hard. She must have been kicked unseen or brushed by a car. Too young to know much, she was beginning to learn to use the newspaper spread on the kitchen floor and to win wedding there the words, good dog, good dog. Okay. Now that paragraph, or excuse me, that stanza doesn't tell us anything really, right? Other than what is the age of the dog? 
Not literally. Young. It's a puppy. How do you know? The dog is being house trained. And it knows to relieve itself on the newspapers. We thought her shy malaise was a shot reaction. If you've ever taken puppies to the vet and they get their shots, they often just want to sleep the rest of the day. The autopsy. Autopsy tells us what? This dog's dead. Disclosed a rupture in her liver. This is why the poet says she must have been kicked unseen or brushed by a car. Because you don't get liver damage unless you take a pretty good blow. As we teased her with play, blood was filling her skin and her heart was learning to lie down forever. That is, playing with a ball, playing with a rope, and the dog's trying to play. Why? Good dog. While it's slowly dying. Monday morning, as the children were noisily fed and sent to school, she crawled beneath the youngest bed. Why the youngest? Here we're meant to assume something. Or maybe read into it a little bit. The dog is closest to the youngest. That is, this is the youngest dog. I grew up in a large family, five kids. We didn't all have pets at the same time. But we sometimes did. You know, one would have a rabbit, one would have a guinea pig. The dogs would usually be all of ours, but, you know, one dog or cat may be more uh, close to one individual. So the dog climbs under the youngest bed. We found her twisted and limp, but still alive. In the car to the vets on my lap, she tried to bite my hand and died. I stroked her warm fur. My wife called in a voice imperious with tears. Called what? The dog's name. Like, come back. Though surrounded by love that would have upheld her, nevertheless she sank and Stephanie disappeared. Back home, after the trip to the vet, we found that in the night, that is the night before, her frame drawing near to dissolution, her body dying, had what? Had endured the shame of diarrhea. And what does the dog do? And it dragged across the floor to a newspaper carelessly left there. Why did the dog drag its dying carcass to the newspaper? Good dog. To get that praise. Okay, so what is this poem designed to do? Designed. Yeah, it's designed to make you cry. This is overt sentimentality. Now, I don't, we don't have a poem in the book that used to be in here. I'm going to make a copy of it for all of you. It's called Midterm Break. And it's by Seamus Haney, Nobel Prize winning, Irish poet. That's kind of designed the same way. But in that poem, you don't get the, the knife thrust to the heart until the last line. I won't say anything more about it. So, pleasure of words. Well, look at the question Meyer asked. How would the poem be different if it were titled Dog's um, Good Dog rather than Dog's Death? Dog's Death tells you what? Tells you what's coming. Good Dog, no. Good Dog, you don't hear, you don't expect to hear about the dog dying. If it were titled Good Dog, the title would be what? Misleading. Misleading. Ironic. Okay. So, top of 760. Now we're going to start doing a bunch of terms. 760, doggerel. What is doggerel? The poem on the previous page. Ice cream, me scream, we all scream for ice cream. Why is that doggerel? Because really, how important is ice cream? I mean, if you're Ben and Jerry... It's really important because it's your bread and butters. But it is trite and it uses a rhythm and sounds that are monotonous and heavy handed. Okay? Keep turning pages. 762. A paraphrase. Every one of you knows what a paraphrase is because you've written papers or you will write papers where you will paraphrase what somebody else says. 
That means you take their ideas and you put it into your words. But with poetry, it is a prose restatement of the central ideas of the poem, okay? In your own words. What would a, a paraphrase of ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream be? We like ice cream. That would pretty much be it. Go on a bit more to bottom of 768. Who's the speaker in Ice Cream, We Cream, Well? There isn't one. Who's the speaker in Dog's Death? The husband. The husband. Who's the speaker in Those Winter Sundays? A child. Okay. What is the speaker? It's the voice used by the poet to do what? To tell the poem. It's not necessarily the poet. A lot of people, they'll read something like Shakespeare's sonnets, and they'll assume the speaker is Shakespeare. You can't. The speaker is somebody created. Another term that gets used for speaker is a persona. Persona means kind of a person created within the poem to be the speaker of the poem. We'll see one in a few moments. Okay. So you have narrators in fiction, like in Barn Burning, who tells us the story. You have a speaker or persona in poetry. Okay? 770, 771. 770, pretty simple. Verse, lines composed in a measured rhythmical pattern, which are often, not always, rhyme. Okay? Anagram we're not going to do. Theme, bottom of 771. It's what it always is. It's the central idea or meaning. Okay. Central idea or meaning of a poem. 772. Lyric. You listen to them all day long, or you hear them all day long. Sometimes you're listening to them on the radio. Sometimes they come on TV in terms of a commercial jingle or song. Right? Brief poem that expresses the personal emotions and thoughts of a single speaker. And you got a little short one down there at the bottom of that page. Okay, poem that tells a story, a narrative poem. Did Dog's Death tell a story? Yeah. Right? A really long narrative poem that is focused on heroic events, okay, or Important events is an epic. You might have read some epics in high school, like Beowulf or part of it. Okay? It's a famous Old English epic. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Dante's Divine Comedy. Pages 774 and 75. You've got 12 suggestions for, I, I don't hate that word, approaching poetry should be for reading poetry, or understanding poetry, or appreciating poetry, okay? First one's the most important one. Assume you're going to need to read it more than once. Why? It works differently than other kinds of literature. It's often ambiguous, for example, which means you got to read it and kind of tease out the various meanings of the ambiguity and such, and then several other things. Pay attention to the title, etc. Go on a little bit more. Page 779. Three turns. Clichés, stock responses, sentimentality. We've, we've, you all know what a cliché is. An idea, expression, a phrase that's become tired and trite from overuse. Um... Like, you know, when there's some kind of terrorist attack or something, and two leaders will say, we stand shoulder to shoulder. Well, all that implies today is they, they're standing next to each other. Not realizing, that is, people who hear that don't realize, that's a almost 3,000-year-old military metaphor of the old Greek phalanx. 
standing shoulder to shoulder means there's no daylight between you so that the enemy can break your ranks. Okay? Stock responses. What is the stock response that dog's death is designed to do? The captain said it. Tears. Okay. Sentimentality exploits the reader by inducing responses that exceed what the situation warrants. Now, I don't know. Maybe dog's death doesn't exceed. Depends on, I guess, if you're an animal lover or not. Um, let's go on to 794.95. You've got 26 suggestions for responsive reading and writing. Now, you're not going to be writing anything about poetry, but those might help you understand and appreciate um, the various poems we'll be doing if you, you know, use some of those questions to help inform your understanding. Page 801, chapter 24. Diction. This is under word choice, word order, and tone. Diction is just poet's choice of words. Why choose this word when you could choose another word? And you have different kinds of diction on page 802. Poetic diction. Use of elevated language rather than ordinary language. The translators of the King James Version of the Bible use poetic diction. Why? Because in Shakespeare's day, or excuse me, in 1611, someone would not have said, my cup runneth over. They would say, my cup runs over. The F ending, like half versus has, that TH ending was, as of 1611, already old, already archaic. Okay? Formal diction. Dignified, impersonal, elevated use of language. So how is that little snippet from Thomas Hardy's poem, Formal Diction? Well, you don't even have to look at the lines from the poem, just the title of the poem itself. The Convergence of the Twain. What is a convergence? A coming together. So why not just the coming together of the two? Because that's exactly what that means. If you were meeting somebody to go out to dinner, you wouldn't say, let's converge at, but you could. But that's elevated formal language, okay? Then you have middle diction. Less formal level, but it's the kind of the language of most educated speak, of most educated people. Spoken, this should be added, I think, in educated circles. That is... It's the language spoken by educated people, people with a you know, university degree, in kind of an appropriate um, setting. It's not, middle diction, is not what an educated person normally speaks, let's say, at home. Or um, at a sporting event, okay? That is going to be informal diction. Informal diction is kind of the everyday, common, ordinary language we speak. When, when people find out I'm an English professor, they always do one of two things. Oh, I hated English. They either shut up or they say, I hated English. And I'm always like, one, you don't have to shut up. Two, I understand, because usually because of how it's taught. Including how I teach it, I'm sure. They shut up because, you know, I don't know, speak no good. And I always have to tell them, none of us speak, quote unquote, proper English. Proper English is a written form. Okay? So, you got an example down there at the bottom. Page 803, dialect. You got a southern dialect. You've got New England dialect. You've got Boston dialect. You know, I'm going to park my car at Harvard Yard kind of a thing. Okay. You've got, you know, Tidewater, Virginia dialect. My grandfather, who was 
born in Colorado and raised in Iowa. We're talking about his tar. I'm going to get some all to put in his car. And the tar was out of air. Tire was out of air. Uh, when my wife and I got married, one of her little, I don't know, cousins, whatever, some weird relation, you know, stood up and goes, well, there's Taya. And my name, which has one syllable and one vowel in it, developed two or three vowels and a couple of syllables. Okay? Dialect. Jargon. Depending on what your major is, your major has its own jargon. If you're a nursing major, you're going to learn all kinds of jargon to describe, you know, drugging and all that kind of stuff. If you're a recording industry, something else. If you're, you know, aerospace, something else. Why? It's shorthand. It makes it easier for you and somebody else in that field to converse without having to waste a lot of breath. Okay? Denotations, connotations. Denotations, literal definitions, dictionary meanings of word. Connotations, what those words suggest. That is, other associations, like the difference, you know, the various meanings in this word. Blue, right? It could be blue. It could also be what? I'm blue today means I'm not a smurf. I'm sad, okay? Depressed. Eight oh four, eight oh five. Look at this little poem. Randall Gerald, Death of the Ball Turret Gunner. I don't remember if that's one I have on here or not. I think it is. If not, we'll add to it. It's just five lines. So what's a ball turret? World War II, bombers, B-17, head. There's another one, a B-25, I think head, turrets um, on the belly of the plane, some of them on the top of the fuselage, okay? Turrets, round, glass and enclosures, about six feet in diameter, I think, that you would go down, you'd sit in, and these things could rotate. If you ever saw Star Wars, you know, you have the one scene in the Millennium Falcon where Luke shoots one of the TIE fighters and says, I got one, and Han Solo says, don't get cocky, kid. Well, he's in a turret there, which rotate, and they have machine guns to shoot fighters that are coming after them. So this is the death of the ball turret gunner, the guy who sits in that. Again, like dog's death, this guy dies. From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state, and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. From my mother's sleep, it doesn't mean from when my mother was asleep. It's from when I was sleeping in my mother in a womb. I fell into the state that as I was born, and I find myself now, what? In the state, which can mean in the position of or under the responsibility of the state, the government. And I hunched in its belly, that is, this state, the ball turret, till my wet fur froze. How does this guy have wet fur? Bomber's jacket. Bomber's jacket is lined with fur. Why? Because these bombers, World War II, were not heated. And he's flying about 30,000 feet. How do we know? Six miles from Earth. So 30,000 feet, what's the temperature outside? If you've ever flown, and gotten up 30,000 feet, I don't think you get to 30,000 feet if you fly from here to Atlanta. I think you only get up to about 20. But if you've ever flown cross country, across an ocean, you get up 30, 32, maybe 35,000 feet. And you can, you know, get on your little screen thing and see what the outside temperature is. And at 30,000 feet, you're usually 100, 150 below. So it's pretty cold. So inside, maybe not that cold. Not 150. Might be 75, 100 below. So inside the plane, you're pretty cold. That's why you've got on a fur-lined jacket. So why does the wet fur freeze? And why is the fur wet? 
What's his position again? He's the gunner. It's his job to keep the safe plane from the fighters that are coming after him. He's sweating. He's nervous. So the plane, excuse me, his coat is getting wet from the sweat, and it's freezing almost instantly. Six miles from Earth, loosed from its dream of life. What he's doing right now isn't a dream. When I was down on Earth, then I had a dream. What was the dream? Well, this is what my life would be like. Not being six feet up, six miles up. My life would be married, children, picket fence, you know, maybe that kind of thing. It's a wonderful life kind of an idea. Six miles from Earth, loose from its dream of life, I what? I woke. Why? Because that wasn't real. That was the dream. This is real. And what's he wake to? Black flag. And the nightmare fires. When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. So what's the tone of that? Almost has a little element of sarcasm to it. Okay? Persona, top of 805. Person created by the poet. That's the ball turret gunner. Ambiguity. Since you're not writing a paper in here, you don't have to worry about this with my class. But you will write papers, maybe this semester and other classes. You don't want to have ambiguity in those papers. You want to be crystal clear. You want to write in black and white for all your other professors. <clears throat> Unless you're taking a creative writing class. In which case, be as ambiguous as hell. Okay, because then it's good. Ambiguity allows for two or more simultaneous interpretations of a word, phrase, action, situation. <coughs> when I get papers, upper division classes, and I write, you know, this can mean more than one thing. That's not a good thing. Page 806. Oops. Page 806. Word order. Ordering of words in a meaningful verbal patterns is called syntax. Okay? That is, the syntax of something is just how the writer arranges the words. Tone, we've talked about that before. Writer's attitude. What's the attitude? What's the tone of dog's death? It's kind of sad. It's kind of, you know, dreary. 808. Dramatic monologue. Probably everyone in here stayed up at one point or another and watched some kind of late night comic. Jimmy Kimmel, whatever. And how do they begin every show? With a monologue. Where one person logs, it's words, words out to other people. Speaks. Okay? But this is describing a dramatic monologue. In a dramatic monologue, you have a speaker talking to an implied audience. And the speaker reveals something about him or herself that he or she doesn't mean to. That they accidentally give a little bit more away than they want. And we'll read one in a, um, not today, in a few days. All right? Keep turning pages. Carpe diem, which we've already talked about. What's it mean? Seize the day. Seize the day. Why? Usually Carpe Diem poems have to do with one theme. Love. I was going to say sex, but yeah, love and sex or something like that. Seize the day. Live today. Why? Because tomorrow you might be dead. So you have Robert Herrick's To the Virgins to Make Much of Time. We'll read that one. That's one that's later on the syllabus, so we won't read it then. To the Virgins to Make Much of Time. This is written in the mid-17th century, 1648. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a-flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. So there's an image. 
It's not gather roses, it's gather rose buds. What's the difference between a rose and a rose bud? The rose is opened. The bud is still more or less closed. So gather the rose buds today. Why? Time. Time's moving on, man. And the flower that smiles today, that is, that opens all the way, the rose, tomorrow, those petals will be dropping off. That is, it'll be done. That's first image. Next stanza, another image. The glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's a getting, the sooner will his race be run, and nearer he's to setting. That's this image. Sun rises in the east, and at noon, it reaches the PM, the prime meridian. And what happens? It starts to set. This is middle age. So once you get to middle age, you're on the downward slide. That age is best, which is the first, when youth and blood are warmer. But being spent, the worse and worse, time still succeed the former. He's not talking about when you're a baby, or when you're an infant, or when you're a child. The speaker means when you are in your prime. Most of you guys, all of you guys, in your 20s. Why? Because now your blood and youth are warmer. Your blood is like this water, right? Moves easily. It's very fluid. Replace the image of water, bacon grease. You've just fried up some bacon. You've taken the bacon off. And now you've got the grease in the skillet. And you can take that skillet and do this. And what does the grease do? Slash it around, right? Let it sit there for an hour or two, and what happens to it? It congeals. It hardens. My blood, according to this Renaissance idea, is like that hardened grease. Because I'm no longer young. Then be not coy. But use your time, and while you may go, Mary, for having lost but once your prime, you may forever tarry. Who's the poem addressed to? Title, to the virgins to make much of time. Do we know what the speaker means by virgins? Male or female? Can males be virgins? Yeah, Steve Carroll did a movie, The 40-Year-Old Virgin. It was about a man. It wasn't about a woman. There's one word in that poem that suggests the virgins are women. Anyone take a guess as to which word? Coy. Coy. Coy is an adjective that is almost always exclusively reserved for women. It's not applied to men. Be not coy. What does it mean? Don't be. Shy, maybe. What happens if you take shyness, natural shyness, <coughs> and describe a little dark intent to it? Don't be hard to get. That is, the speaker is suggesting women do what? Play games. Okay? And the guys are going, get right there. Be not coy, but use your time. Carpe diem, use your day. And while you may, go marry. Now, where did I erase that? I had written right here. M-A-R-R-Y, but it also implies M-E-R-R-Y. Go merrily, go happily, go joyfully. Why? You lose once your prime, and the prime there initially surface level means your youth, your, your um, best years, so to speak. You may forever, Terry. We have another phrase today. Use it. Or lose it. If you don't use it when you're young, you will lose it. That is, nobody will want to use it when you're old. Right? What's the it? Your beauty, 
Use your beauty now while you're young. Because when you're old and wrinkled and gray and saggy, nobody's going to want to come near you. Okay? Now, turn from that one. That's one of the two best and most famous Carpe Diem poems in the English language. This is the next one. Page 814, Andrew Marvell. This is also on the syllabus later, so we'll talk about it today, and then we, we'll skip it later. Three stanzas, and the stanzas taken in succession argue an idea. Had, but, now. So, had we but world enough in time, this coyness lady, okay, there it is again, this plain, hard to get, lady, were no crime. Had we implies what? Had I bought that $1.6 billion winning lottery ticket, I didn't. <laughs> that was sold somewhere in South Carolina. Had we implies we don't. So, had we but world enough in time, this coyness lady were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long loves day. Have you never, when you were a younger kid, summer, got together with a friend or friends? What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? And you waste the whole freaking day not knowing what to do, or at least an hour or two? He says, if we had all the time in the world, this is what we could do. You could sit by the Indian Ganges side, the Ganges River in India, and look for rubies. And I would sit by the Umber and complain. The Umber is a river in North, northern England. And when he says complain, he doesn't mean moan and gripe and complain. He means write love songs. A complaint, when uh, Marvell was writing this, was a love song. Okay, so I would love you 10 years before the flood. What's the flood? It's capitalized. Who famously had something to do with the flood? Noah. Which is, I believe, Genesis 9. So I would start loving you 10 years before Noah's flood, and you should, if you please, refuse to the conversion of the Jews. When's the conversion of the Jews? End of the world. So I'd say, come on, if you really love me, and you go, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm a good girl. Until the end of the world. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. Vegetable <coughs> just means slow growing. Plant a pumpkin seed. Plant a watermelon seed. It takes about three months for that thing to finally produce a ripe pumpkin or watermelon. So what would he do while his love grows? He says, a hundred years should go to praise your eyes. So there's a hundred. Two hundred to adore each breast. So he obviously, he likes her breasts more than he likes her eyes and forehead. Because that's 400 years right there. Versus 100 for her eyes and forehead. But then what? But 30,000 to the rest. Notice where does he stop? Uh, excuse me, where does he start? Up here? To here? To here? He's telling us what his interest is in. Okay? And the last A should show your heart. See, it's not just all about sex. It's, he really wants to know her heart. For lady, you deserve this state. What would I love at lower rate? At lower rate? What has that just done to kind of talk about her heart? Lower rate would be like if I pulled out a bunch of cash and flipped through it because I had ones and fives and tens and twenties and found a 50 or and go, honey, you're worth at least 50. He's introduced economic language. Okay. But, but 
always applies. You don't. You have really nothing to hide. At my back, I always hear loves, excuse me, times, wing and chariot drawing me. And yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty, why is eternity deserts and not paradise, not Eden? Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. Why will she no longer be beautiful? What happens when you're dead and buried for a hundred years? Body rots. Then worms shall try that long preserve her genitai, and your quaint honor turn to dust. And we'll stop with this. How are ver verbs, worms going to try her virginity? Try means prove, test. They're going to go in and out what you wouldn't let me go in and out of. It's a pretty disgusting image, right? You haven't heard the Worst of it. Your quaint honor turned to dust? What does quaint mean? If you describe something as quaint, it means it's nice, it's fine, it might be it's small. It's not what it means here. Here, it comes from the Middle English quainta. In Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, one of the characters tells a tale, and it involves a guy named Nicholas, who's given the, the description handy. And he goes around grabbing this young lady by the quinta. It's the word from which we get cut. It's the you know medieval Donald Trump and Access Hollywood tape. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. We'll pick up at that spot on Wednesday. I'll have your exams for you on Wednesday. We won't have a quiz Wednesday. We might on Friday.